record this. So hi, welcome. I'm Cheryl from the Giuseppe Center uh, for Arts and Culture in Joseph, Oregon. And we are thrilled to host a new exhibit at the Giuseppe Center starting today. Um, and it's called Three Creative Journeys with um, three artists, Mike Koloski, Leslie Leviner, and Mary Edwards. And uh, so what I would like to do is, um, because we're doing this uh, via Zoom and you can't come in the gallery, I figured I could walk us through the um, website. And it's a slide show, or you can just look at individual artists' work and encourage you to um, look at it a few times or uh, even buy something. So uh, I encourage you all to check it out, but I'm gonna share it with you. And I'm, I'm hoping Mary, who Mary Edwards is on the call, so maybe she can pipe in a couple of details of um, a, a thing or two about her photography, which is really uh, beautiful. You can also tell on Mike and Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, all of our secrets from the past. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, they're not here to uh, deny them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, and uh, I feel very lucky because Mary made me a, a, a little blueberry margarita, so I'll be enjoying that, and she seems to be sipping on one herself. Um, okay, so here we go. Where's my safari? Here we go. So on our website, www.josephi.org, um, if you are on the home page, um, oops, I'm in the admin, so you can see all the background. So one thing um, I didn't mention is we are reopening on Monday. June 22nd and our hours will be 12 to 4. Um, one thing is it does say on this little, um, actually we'll be open 12 to 5, so I need to change that sign. Um, one thing that is on this sign, it says ma masks recommended, but we have changed that to masks are required. So if you decide to come in, please be wearing a mask. If you don't have a mask, ask for a mask, we do have masks available. And we definitely want to see you in, but we want we also want to see some social distancing and we really don't want more than 10 people in a party in the gallery at the same time. So um, first, masks are required. Second, socially distance when you're here. Um, the gallery will be open. All the paintings that I'm going to show you that are on the website are in the gallery and they look Fantastic. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures of them, but I'll let I'll savor that for you to come in and check it out for yourself. So if you want to go to our website and check this out, there's one thing I'm gonna say that is a silent auction is going on. It's ending at six o'clock today. So if anybody wants to check out the three images that we have, um, looks like there's been some busy bidding and uh, the hurricane is a photograph by Mary Edwards and there's a bid for 155. We'd love to see that higher up, go up higher. Um, the great thing about this silent auction is the proceeds, all the money is going to the Willowa County Business Fund. So I'm really thrilled that these three artists are able to contribute to the community this way and I think um, it's a great way of how art can help it, you know, raise money for great ventures. So um, thanks to Mary, Mike, and Leslie for doing that. And especially to Mary who printed all of these and typed up all the descriptions and um, has come in several times today to make sure everything is ready to go. And um, we're just waiting for six o'clock to come along so we can, uh, hand these off to some great winners. So um, this link is on our front page or it's on every page um, because it's at the very top. 
So, and I'm, we're going to probably replace this with the exhibit, the current exhibit. So this, instead of saying silent auction after today, it will be the new virtual exhibit. So if you go under exhibits and you go under current exhibit, you see our three uh, creative journeys and Mary wrote a little preface here. Here's our silent auction items. And let's see. So here we're gonna click for the virtual slideshow. I feel like there should be some music, like, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> some background music to like get this all, this excitement is so, um, so right now, um, you can view this two different ways. You can go to the artist and um, scroll through or uh, look at all of their images, or you can do the slideshow. So down here is the slideshow. And this was Mary's idea of a tip jar. So tip the artist, give five bucks actually, here or there. Actually, I think that the tip jar I was kind of thinking it sort of, um, this is rather late, but that would be a tip jar for the Giuseppe Center because you have fewer people coming in and so donate your donation jar is not quite as available. Okay. And so that would be a just a, you know, and, and maybe an easy way for when somebody's purchasing something. So anyway, I, I'm thinking about this for the center. <laughs> Well, any money that is um, tipped to us, we will apply towards um, this exhibit and future exhibits. So uh, it's a good cause. Exhibits cost a lot of money to put together, and um, it also takes a lot of energy. So um, anyway, I'm going to start with this slideshow. So here, this is one of Mary Edwards' picture. It's a reflection from the car show, which is like one of the best funnest events here in Wallowa County. And I love this picture where you just happen to capture your reflection with uh, two friends, it looks like. Um, yeah. And I love your feet down at the bottom, you know, under where it says Buick. So it kind of catches the reflection in two different ways. It's a great photo. Um, and uh, Mary's written a little description over on the side. It won a huge award at the Arts Festival, um, first place award at the Arts Festival in 2003 and 2007. So that's awesome. Well, it was just one. Um, so this one was 2007 and the little black and white, this, the description is just a little off, but we can edit that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was the main description we wrote for how things would hang, so. Okay. And this image is for sale, so you can just um, go right here if you decide you want to buy it. Maybe you want to buy a bunch of them. So the great thing about photographs is you can print, you can sell more than one, and you can sell it unframed or framed. So um, uh, one cohesive part of this exhibit is that for me, um, as the executive director, I feel like these three artists coming together and, and why we're doing this show is because these are three artists that I felt and many others feel that they have been deserving a show. And not only are they kind of um, behind the scenes type of people, they've all been president or um, have run the Wallowa uh, Valley Festival of Arts They've also um, coordinated a lot around the arts in Wallowa County. And, um, but they're creative people and they're highly skilled and creative at the same time. And so I don't want to say that they're old, but they're a little <laughs> bit older than me. And their art is worthy of celebration. And I think this is the perfect venue um, for them to show their work, give them the opportunity to have a full um, sort of uh, catalog of, of works together. And because they are very understated and not flashy in your face about 
how talented they are. Not that most, not that artists would do that, but um, I just think that there's a little bit of a reserve there. And boy, they, they, they may not be um, uh, selling artwork left and right, but there is something compulsive and um, there's a need for them to continue to create. And there's certain things that each of these artists are attracted to and you see it recurring in their works. And um, that's kind of what we found is common ground for all three of the artists. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So you can see there's a ribbon of images right here. Um, I, there's also a little arrow here. So you can hit the arrow and there's my Koloski's Appalachia image. Um, oh, there's the arrow. I see it now. It was, it was, yeah. I, I was looking for it at the end of the, the uh, boxes, but it's at the edge of the page. So I, I see it now. You know, it almost would be easier if it was maybe black. So yeah, uh, maybe, maybe we change the color so that it's a little bit easier to see. So Mike Koloski, um, he's in his um, early 40s. <laughs> no. um, he's been <laughs> painting for a long time and um, he did get his master's in fine art. Um, he usually um, paints with oils. I think primarily that's his, um, his, his medium. And here he grew up in Ohio and this is just one scene that kind of um, makes him reminisce of those olden days of uh, Appalachia and little, he says here in the description, it's a swimming hole in Ohio's Sunfish Creek. And uh, it's a beautiful painting. I love the, the colors in it. It's, it's, it's kind of dark, but at the same time, there's like some spring coming to life there. Um, or maybe winter's just about over. Um, it, it's definitely got some emotional edge to it, and uh, especially with the cloudy sky and the kind of barren trees in the background. So anyway, I'm just gonna keep clicking away, and um, all of these paintings are here. Um, I, be I believe all of them are here. There's one or two that's missing because uh, we're still waiting for some frames to come in, but by Monday, hopefully they'll all be here. This is a Leslie Leviner painting, um, Refreshing August Rain. And there's also, um, Leslie has had formal training. She uh, has a, a mentor that she uh, grew up looking at his paintings. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, um, but it's this very traditional landscape painting and he also painted horses. And so she has a love for horses and she also has this um, unique ability to capture light. And uh, I think in this painting, you can really see, it's obvious that there's been a storm going on and there's puddles and and all that, but I just, I love her paintings. They're, um, they're so highly, they're well done and um, the compositions are wonderful. You know, I know of several other artists and just people in town who have followed Leslie and, you know, her work and, and we talk about it in terms of Levine or light the way that she captures light in her paintings is, I, you know, there are other artists that I work that I'm familiar with that have that gift, but Leslie has it in spades. Yeah. And some of the, you know, when you get to more of, of her landscapes, even in this subtle composition though, it's remarkable, you know, um, but yeah, Leviner light. <laughs> Leviner light, I like that, yeah. And, you know, she's also extremely skilled at um, presenting animal or, you know, illustrating animals. And I, that's not easy, um, especially horses, because they have so many muscles and... Yeah, um, so it can look very like, contrived if you're not skilled at it. And she is just, you know, like I said, she has it in spades. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So, you know, like I said, she's formally trained, has been formally trained, and she's been painting since she was, I think, in her teens. So she's been painting for a very long time. All right, so I'm gonna keep clicking on and, oh, Mary, this is a really beautiful photograph. Um, I was looking at this earlier today and I, at first I didn't really know what I was looking at. And then when I read your description, um, it always seems like your photographs, like how did you get that vantage point? Like, are you on top of a hill or are you, is this like- An airplane. <laughs> An airplane. I mean, it's not just this photo. It's like a lot of your photos, you have this, I don't know, are you hiking up like mountains? And um, anyway, this is, uh, you've, you've captured wind, rain, hail, and snow, or this particular storm in these clouds. And uh, it's just, it's beautiful. It's black and white. Um, you, you, when we first talked, you said, oh, I, I thought I would have a couple of color images and turned out that almost all of them are black and white. Isn't that, is yeah. that You know, the other thing I would say about this, and, and, and it's very true of my work in terms of themes, and that is that for me, when I look at this kind of landscape, it's earthen waves, it's water. And I mean, there's water happening in the sky, but the evidence, even the way that the land has been tilled, it's like waves of different um, uh, compositions of, of the cropland running over the top of each other. Right. Uh, and, and also the, the, you know, this sort of sensual wave that is actually deposited, you know, this soil was deposited by wind and, and um, is extremely fertile. And so all of that, I'm always really tied up in water, <laughs> even right. in the desert, you know, I find forms or um, images that are, that for me remind me of water or reflection um, or the influence of water. I think that would be a perfect coffee table book just about water because water is so controversial. Yeah. And, um, you know, we all need it. We, every animal, in existence needs water. So water is a pretty important topic. Um, but I think you're right. I When I first was looking at this photograph, I was thinking water. And, um, you know, it just took me a little bit to focus on what I was looking at. So uh, the Palouse is when you, and then when you turn it to, when you make the photograph black and white, it really makes you look a, a second time because the colors would just, um, the photograph wouldn't be the same if it was in color. Um, yeah, it's interesting, you know, one, the other piece that goes with this is a color photograph, one of only two in the show, but um, at this distance, I, you know, I was up on Steptoe Butte when I shot all of this, it just did not work, it didn't hold together as a color photograph, and right. when I dropped it to black and white, it was like, oh yeah, there it is. Well, but the other is, one that is yeah. the color one that's called Palouse Waves uh, that, you know, I don't know if you're going to go through each one, but, um, but that works. I mean, it would maybe work as a black and white. I think I did drop it down, but it really, it works better as color. So it's very interesting to me um, how things translate. Sometimes color just is not where you want to go. And in this whole show, going back to black and white was definitely a choice for me. Um, and I, you know, that's what I, I fell in love with photography was black and white. <laughs> yeah. So. I think black and white's my favorite photography too, because it's just, it, there is something a little bit expressive about it that um, you just see things a totally different way. And obviously it's because there's no color. So um, let me move on to the next one. This is another really beautiful photograph, obviously in the desert. Um, and same thing where you're in this vantage point where you're not like down, you know, right there, you must be up on a hill. And uh, again, undulating lines. 
Um, yeah, it was just a river of sand. I mean, these are the dunes actually in, in Death Valley. There's not an actual river called the Sand River, <laughs> which is what I titled this. Um, but it just so reminds me of waves. And when I was on this particular trip in Death Valley, um, where I actually took the first photograph that I was ever really consciously aware of trying to take a photograph for a specific reason with an old Polaroid, um, <clears throat> it, it just seemed everywhere I went in Death Valley, <laughs> I was seeing water everywhere. And, you know, it's the driest place on earth, <laughs> right. one of the hottest. But again, that whole form of, it's like, oh, that's like a river of sand. You know, it just, you know, it was just there for me. Yeah, yeah. Fun. Fun, yeah. And obviously, you know, your photography takes you many places. So, you know, first you have the Palouse and then you have Death Valley and, and you have Willow County, which is like a canvas, an, you know, all, always giving canvas. You know, it always has a subject, no matter what the sky, you know, what from day to day, what it's going to turn out to be. Um, but it does look like you're curious, you're curious enough to travel to different geographic, geo geological areas um, to explore what you can find, which is, that's kind of part of being um, an artist uh, and, and especially a photographer is searching for your next, your, your next uh, model or your next subject. Um, so I won't go through every single one. I just wanted to yeah. <laughs> um, kind of get people uh, oriented with how this is. I did want to point, I did want this uh, painting uh, to talk about it because it, it did win quite a few awards. Um, uh, Leslie wrote, Rendezvous at Sunrise. Um, this painting won the Equine Images Publishers Award at the American Academy of Equine Arts annual show. The lighting inspiration came from a photo I took of my cows eating hay at sunrise on a winter morning. The images of the Native Americans were from some tiny old historical photo and I had to use a magnifying glass to get any detail at all. So um, this is just a really beautiful painting and I think what what really strikes me is again the light and the yeah. shadows that um, uh, are part of this. Now this painting is um, it is for sale um, and I don't know if it has size. Let's see, let's see if it's in the cart. So it's a 20 by 24 oil. And uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful painting. So if you're interested, you can buy it. Um, but obviously, and the frame is beautiful as well, but the light in this is just exquisite. And I love, um, even just behind the horses, how the light hits the grass there. Um, and then the shadows. Um, and again, like the horses are very well done. And um, I just, I think it's a wonderful composition as well. So. Yeah, the light is, you know, for me at the top of that painting. Um, yeah. And it sets the tone into the background and then you move forward. And like you said, even into the, how the shadows are cast, it's, and seeing it up close, I mean, this is a wonderful reproduction here, uh, you know, for online viewing, but the layering of her paint in this is really amazing. I, I look at, at, at this painting when I go in and, or, you know, see it and it's just stunning. So the great thing about this um, exhibit is we are making a catalog and um, you may not want to pay $17.50 for the painting, but the catalog, I believe, we haven't set a price on it yet. I think it's gonna be $15. And um, we are just about done uh, designing it and it will be for sale. We don't have a cart up yet to pre-purchase um, 
but uh, we will get that up as soon as possible so that you can pre-order it, we can mail it to you, or you could come pick it up, or you can come when we're open and buy it, um, pre-order buy it. And we are hoping to have it in about two weeks, so it'll be here at the Josephi Center at that time. Um, all of the writings that you see on the website will be in the uh, catalog, as well as more extensive uh, bios and a couple of pieces that each of the uh, painters, uh, artists have uh, written. Uh, and those, write, those writings are also in the gallery downstairs next to each of the images. So um, if you want to just select one of the artists, you can see, you could just go to Mike Koloski, um, the tab there, and you'll see his images um, so you can just peruse by artists rather than by the slideshow. And uh, I'd highly encourage you to take a look and, uh, and leave a tip. Like I said, the, the, we'll change this. The tip is not going to be for the, the artist, but it'll be for the Josephi Center. And it'll help support this particular exhibit as well as future exhibits um, that we are bringing along. So our next exhibit will be the wild landscape. We've done this exhibit for the past five years. This will be our sixth year. And um, it's one of my favorite shows because we really get to celebrate the beauty of our county. And we will be making a catalog of that exhibit as well. And that, would, that will open on July 31st. So um, if there's anything else, uh, Mary, that you want to bring up, or let me show your, your, because Oh, I, I, let's spend some time with Mike's. Oh, okay. You just, yeah, go to his page. Uh, I think I got yours. I, um. So I am I am recording this. So what'll happen is this will get put on YouTube and we'll put it on this page as well so people can watch it. And um, I wish I could edit it because I'm sure I stuttered through half of it. But <laughs> no, you sound I, fine. I was not trained as a broadcast um, Hollywood uh, Oprah Winfrey or you know, anyway. And can I don't you click on looks all that great today, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> can you click on the Losting River at Pullbridge? Does it get bigger if you click on it? Okay. Uh, no. uh, and then click on that. Oh, it looks. Uh, if you click on the um, the little yeah, that it should go to that. Okay. So I I just wanted to share a little bit about this. Um, it's um this painting hangs in my living room normally <laughs> and i've had it since 2013 uh is when mike we uh in the Wallow valley festival of arts we commissioned mike Kolaski uh to do a painting for our poster um for the show that year but the thing that's really impressive about this painting and when you see it either up close and actually it was hard to photograph and um, I tried very hard to get that sort of dull matte um, uh, brush stroke that's at the edges in the trees. Um, it's so hard to not point directly at something in this procedure but anyway the point of it being um, oh. is that the way that that Mike has painted this is if you've ever spent time in any kind of canyon, um, you know, in the in in the mountains, the light changes as it as it travels across the canyon, and so as it does that, you see different shadow and different details, and that's what this painting does throughout the day. Whatever light is in your house, because I see the same thing at the at you know at the Giuseppe Center when it's hung down there. And it is has very much to do with the quality of his palette uh, knife work in the trees. Mm -hmm. And if you see, it's very flat in certain areas. And then other parts of it have more vivid 
um, paint. But by doing that um, application to it with his palette knife help to cr helps to create this illusion of light as it travels across the canyon. And it's a little bit washed out in, in the, the uh, um, painting of, um, or the, uh, um, the water uh, as it comes through the white areas are, I didn't quite capture well enough, but uh, it's really truly a remarkable piece in that he has captured light so amazingly well uh, in this piece and uh, really worth coming into the center and, and, you know, seeing it up close and personal. It's, it's really, really remarkable. You make a good point that there's a lot of um, texture in both Leslie and Mike's artwork and you just, you know, and, and the same goes with museums, you know, it's, you really want to be standing three feet from original artwork. It just makes yeah. a huge difference. And I know with COVID, it's, it makes it really difficult, especially people with vulnerable with health uh, risks. But if you can, and, you know, wear a mask, um, come in and check these out. I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's really stunning. Um, I, I, one of the lucky things uh, that I've had since I've been director is um, when I first came on board here, Mike had a studio downstairs and, you know, on occasion um, he would be blasting Steve Miller band and playing <laughs> painting away and I just loved, you know, he has a little window uh, so you could walk by and, and watch him paint and it was just, I, I really miss those days because, uh, you know, he's got yeah. the gold and I, I just love having him in here and, um, you know, I wish I had had the opportunity to uh, really get to know him you know, in his earlier years, and, and I didn't, but I think he's just an amazing person. Um, he he and his wife, they're just, they're so giving to the Josephi Center, and we're so appreciative of everything that they've done for us, and we're really going to miss him. They, he is moving to Colorado. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, but um, as soon as they sell their house, uh, He'll be moving. Yeah. So Mike will be very much missed. And uh, uh, yeah, it just kind of breaks my heart. And, um, and he uh, also has Parkinson's, so he's not creating art like he used to. But I have to say, you know, the things that I've seen him create, even with uh, Parkinson's, is still just stunning work. And uh, he's just a very creative soul and a good person, good heart. And he's done a lot, like um, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, with the Willow Valley uh, Festival of Arts, um, with the yeah. Jesse Center and with the Arts Council. And I think he, he started a, another art organization, maybe like an arts guild type thing for artists. Mm. Anyway. Um, I do love this uh, sea stack painting. This was yeah. one that hung in his studio. And um, boy, I, w I wish I could take this one home because it's, it's just beautiful. And he does have an amazing way, along with the Lostine River at Pole Ridge, as well as here, is just he's really good at capturing water. I, yes. I have taken a couple of oil painting classes and water is like the hardest thing to get right so um, yeah obviously he's had years of practice but he sure does know how to get it right so um and i love this painting too the rock of ages yes um, it's a really um capturing again one of our local uh landscapes i know mike had a really big thing well first he is obsessed with rocks yes secondly <laughs> he did a whole series just on Naha. and um if you haven't been to Naha, it's uh, a beautiful area just east of here 
and uh, you see a lot of rocks just like this rock of ages and uh, this painting is for sale um, and it's 20 by 24 and uh, Mike likes to use these dive on panels which um, they're, they're not like canvases that uh, have that porous uh, um, surface it's more of just a board that's flat and very smooth and so you can see how smooth the painting goes on you can almost see the varnish that he's got on here yeah um so uh that's just a particular style that he um it, that's complementing of his style is this particular board that he likes to paint on um let's go let's go to yours mary um so uh Again, like I just feel like there is one color image, the Palouse waves. Um, looks like water again. Um, yep. <laughs> obviously, here we got a little snow, which is water in some ways. Um, you've got a couple of the car photos. This is a great one with the reflection of the bikers. That was the other one that that one uh, took a first place oh, at, the, at okay. the show. So these two paired together. That's that's how that writing worked. But anyway. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and I don't mean to go through this quickly, but I just had one more. Oh, okay. So this Midway Barn, which I don't think is there anymore, right? It's just completely it's, gone. It's, it's gone. Um, actually, there is um, a, sort of a one-story replica. The person that owns this property um, did salvage a lot of the wood, and you see the diamond uh, window at the top of the barn. He replicated that, and so it's uh, and they it's open. It has no sides now. Gotcha. Uh, what, what he rebuilt, but he completely leveled it after she went down. And um, it really, I mean, for well over, a, I don't know, 15 years, a decade or more, uh, I photographed this barn in, in various stages of falling down. And as I mentioned in the description of the piece, it went down about two weeks after I took this photo. Oh, wow. Yeah. What I love about this photo is you almost feel the tension of it falling. Like, I feel like yeah. I'm gonna, I'm seeing it fall. And uh, the sky is just incredible. Was this, this Midway Barn, was it out towards Zumwalt? Yeah, if you take the, uh, the Zumwalt Road uh, past, um, oh, I think it's about, I don't know, 10 or 12 miles um, out of town. Um, but what was curious to me, and I, I didn't know this for quite a long time, was that actually this was part, how it, I always called it the Zumwalt barn. Um, <laughs> okay. And only, it wasn't until later that I learned the real history of this barn and, that, and the reason why it's called the Midway is because it was midway between Joseph and Imnaha. Uh, oh, okay, and gotcha. and that's how the road that's how you would get there i mean the highway that we take to amnaha now that was not there and there was a livery this was a livery stable there was a small inn next to it um and it, you don't see it in this photograph but there were some other outbuildings that you know off to the uh the left side of the that are hidden by the barn um, so it was, was quite a, an assembly actually of structures at one time and was a stopping place for people traveling from Joseph to Imnaha. That's where you stayed. That's where you put your stock. That's where you spent the night. And when I see these old barns like this, uh, both here and on the Palouse, I always think about the people who built them and, and the dreams that they had um and the vision that they had and and the commitment that they made with each swing of the hammer um with each nail that they drove and each hope uh you know that was commitment to you know to the future and um so i always have a real emotional sort of 
uh, connection and response to to these old structures as they go and um, and think about you know what their original purpose and intent uh, was yeah well I just think this is a really incredible photograph and obviously you know the the thing about photography is the timing you know waiting for the sky to be the right sky and the light the light is so important and what i love about the light on this is just how that whole barn is lit um it almost looks like it could pop out of the of the picture i mean it's it's just really like i said i also feel like it's moving like in the photo so yeah, yeah. It, it's really cool um, let me go back because there's a couple of more that I just, um, this is another barn. Um, I just love this photograph too. Um, it's just like, again, like, I don't know where you're standing to take this photograph. And well, part of it's shooting with a 400 millimeter lens. Okay. And, and doing a pan with that. So it isn't just a single shot. These are several shots stitched together, but to achieve that sort of close, as close as I could get from the road um, is, was using a 400 millimeter lens uh, to do that. But when you say 400 meter, that's like a long yes. lens, right? Yeah, it's quite long. And you but obviously I, have to use a tripod with something like that. Is that correct? I do now. <laughs> there was a time when I could handhold a big beast like that, but um, <laughs> I got to find a fence post or, um, you know, or have my monopod or a tripod or something. But, you know, it's yeah. pretty hard to, to handhold it anymore. Um, but, you know, this is, again, another photograph that, as a color photograph, this was in the fall. Uh, and we'd had an early snow and the, the tamaracks were turning. You kind of see them in the okay. uh, right-hand side above the barn, up the side of the mountain a little bit in the fog. But the, the, as a color photograph, this just does not hang together at all. Uh, I mean, it's, it just doesn't. It was just like, ooh, uh, right. you know. But as a black and white photograph, all those really subtle, lovely, um, qualities of light that were going on uh, and with the change in color there were yellow trees you're not distracted by the color but you're you're you get to tune in to all that really soft sort of lovely foggy light that was happening as this storm started to come through um, but you know I think about the again this old barn uh, and being right there at the opening of Hurricane Creek and just, you know, the hellacious winds that we experience in this valley and how many of these wonderful old barns are, yeah. you know, slowly, you know, succumbing to, you know, to, to time. And, um, but the hurricane, you know, gosh, landslides, avalanches, fire up that canyon, it, it just is you know, it's a world of its own up there. And it, it kind of just spills out down over the valley. Uh, and this barn is right in the path. <laughs> well, you must have, did you take this picture very early in the morning? Because, you know, you don't see the light hit the mountains like that. It actually, it was, it was terrible. It was midday sun. Oh, the sun okay. is, if you look at the top of the photograph, up high the you know sun was already high in the sky okay and uh but you know it was just so it was you know driving i don't know i was probably on the way home from safeway you know taking the back road up hurricane and uh um it just was so beautiful and lovely to see i mean it was like wow i gotta stop and try and get this and i was i, you know, I take it back i think i was probably out shooting fall color that time but again, it just doesn't hold together as a color photograph. Mm -hmm. um, even though there's lovely yellows and, and uh, what have you, it just worked better as a, as a black and white. 
I think you, you know, you almost lose the focal point when you use color, but when you have black and white, it really, I mean, when you're looking at this photograph, the, the first thing I see is that barn. Um, mm -hmm. And then my eye kind of like goes up to the mountains and kind of comes back down to the trees. So I, yeah, you're right. If it was in color, you know, you wouldn't know what to look at first. Yeah, it's very distracting. And, you know, and black and white also is wonderful for being able to hide a host of sins on the landscape <laughs> that that you really don't want lit up you know and so when it when it becomes a simple value um of black and gray white um you know all the shades in between it's uh it helps those things that you don't really want to focus on to recede uh, okay, so let's go back and, um, okay, I absolutely love these dog photos. There's, <laughs> first of all, this dog is so cute. She is pretty photogenic, I have to say. <laughs> she, she, I'm sure she's paid very well for her. You know, she is, um, from the time she was a puppy, I would take her hiking with me all the time and I always carried kibble in my pocket. And I was always taking pictures of her. And so we'd be hiking around up on the moraine and I would put a piece of kibble on the rock and she'll run and jump up on the rock and turn around and, you know, I would take her picture. And so various people have, t friends of mine take her hiking all the time in the high country where I can't go anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, they all come back and they all report to me. It's like, I don't know what she's doing, but she runs and she jumps up on the rocks and turns around and looks at us. <laughs> a tree. Said, she's posing. She's waiting for you to take her picture. I mean, literally she's well-trained. Uh, it's really but adorable. I love this, you know, that whole play on reflection. And when I'm traveling in the truck and driving down into the Imnaha or wherever it is that we're going, she often has her head out the window and I see her in my rear view, in the rear view mirror. Um, and I just, I love that I'm looking forward and I see her and she's looking and I see what's behind. And there's the immediacy of, of you know, what's just adjacent to us as we drive by. And so that whole world is like, wow, to me, you know, it just gets yeah. me like, oh my God, I love it. I can see the road behind and, and the look forward and, you know, it just all, uh, you know, she gets kind of annoyed with me after a while. It's like, come on, mom. <laughs> I know, but you know what? These dogs, uh, they're our companions. They are yeah. with us. And, you know, I, I personally, I mean, I have two dogs. I love dogs. And there is nothing more rewarding than the love that they give us. It's just, yeah. Yeah. So I kind of like how you captured it here. And um, he's, um, he or she, what's her name? She, her name is Finn, F-Y-N-N. -N. She's a okay. good Scottish dog. <laughs> if she's a Labrador. <laughs> a, a yellow lab, right? A yellow lab. She's a so yellow lab. You captured her ear flying and then here in, in Naha with yeah beautiful uh rocks okay so let me see if there's another one that you can talk a little bit about um I did I'll let you talk a little bit about this one because we saw the one this is your only co color photograph in the whole show and um you know I, I see a lot of people um attracted to the Palouse, um, but here again, you are, you're at a vantage point. I'm not sure where you're standing. Are you on top of a hill? I'm up on top of Steptoe Butte. So oh, okay. this so is the same vantage point as the black and white that's called Steptoe Storm. And um, again, I was shooting with a 400 millimeter lens and um, and, and doing it, pulling it in, pulling the landscape in close. Whereas the other one, um, I might've been with my wide angle, but, uh, if I drop this to a black and white, it really doesn't work. 
but this is where it really works as a color photograph for me. Um, it, it, it really, you know, I wanted to capture again, it's the whole concept of water. And for me, as I looked at this, it was the, the, um, oops. Uh-oh, I can't hear you. Maybe you're, I think you muted yourself, no? Uh-oh. Anyway, one thing about this photograph, she must have accidentally uh, disconnected, but the one thing I can say about this photograph is it just feels like it's fuzzy, like uh, it has a texture to it, and um, it's just really wonderful. And same thing, those un undulating lines, um, they're just, you know, your eye is wandering not just the lines of the hills, but also the lines of the farming, um, the cuttings and uh, so forth. So um, the Palouse is located in Eastern Washington, just north of um, Lewiston and east of Walla Walla. It's a really beautiful area and um, a lot of uh, photographers, uh, painters, uh, are really attracted to this particular area because of the undulating hills. So, um, and just, you know, looking at each of Mary's photographs, I'm just, you know, really in awe of her talent and her ability to find the, 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 uh, the subject matter and, you know, capturing the light. And obviously, you know, what I was gonna ask, I think Mary just came back on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, what I was gonna ask was, um, when you were talking about these uh, panoramics, um, I would like a little background on, when you say you take a photo with a 400 millimeter lens, and then you're stitching the photos to, I don't know if stitching is the right word, but you're, you're. No, that, you're, that is the right word. Okay, um, but you're stitching these photos together. Is that something you do in Lightroom or is that something you do in another like photo editing um, program? And how, I, how I used, did you learn this? Because obviously you had to go from film to learning digital. This, uh, you know, this is the, the, million dollar question you know how how did you make that transition and how did you learn to do this well you know it i mean there was a huge learning curve when everything went digital and and um while i did wet dark room work for a long time i was you know <laughs> i'm not i'm not uh i don't miss the dark room all that much <laughs> Um, <laughs> I really don't, especially, happy to. especially doing underwater work, but, but for stitching and, and that is the correct term. Um, I, I use Photoshop and there's, a the old way that people constructed panoramas other than to use a special lens that, uh, enabled you to shoot panoramas. Um, but, uh, what I mean when I use a, a stitching software, I when I photograph, I take a you know I, I aim the lens and and focus on you know what I want to shoot, and I take uh, say the first left half up to that to that rock that sort of looks like sort of a a, a boulder that's been cut in half. So that would be one photograph. And in the old days, you would try, you would shoot very, very carefully, and you still have to shoot very carefully. And then you move uh, on a, you'd have to be on a tripod, and then you, you know, pan to the left, take another snap or, you know, shot, then take another one, then take another one. And depending on how large the scene is, uh, often, you know, governs how many individual photographs you take. And, um, there's actually software that stitches it all together now, but in the old days, I used to have to align 
each photograph. So each edge had to, to have a common uh, element and focal point as the next frame. And you would literally lay them, you know, one next to another, next to another, next to another in Photoshop and uh, make sure that, you know, you, all of your distortions were adjusted. And, and so it was, it was a tremendous amount of work in the early days to do panoramas um, in, you know, in that way. But now they have excellent stitching software that um, it, it still requires quite a bit of adjustment because you have a, a range of light that happens across the, the scene if you're doing landscapes. Uh, and so the, the light quality at say the left hand side versus the far right hand side of this image are totally different exposures. And so you have to adjust for that. And, um, but it's, you know, uh, especially up, you know, here in, in Wallawa County, Wallawa country, you know, it's for your eye, your, the mountains are so huge. And when, when you look out over the valley and you take that in, it's like, taking a single shot of the of the mountains just doesn't quite get it. I mean, it depends on your vantage point. Up in a plane works pretty good. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's taking individual shots and then splicing them together essentially is, is what, how that's constructed. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, this must take hours of your time stitching these images, putting, um, finding the right uh, photo that's in the right shutter speed or or whatever. Um, yeah, you have to have a consistent <laughs> aperture and exposure. Yeah, I mean, it's completely seamless. Like, I have no idea that you've had to go through this whole process to manipulate, and not to say manipulate, but basically to... Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm so grateful for the tools in Photoshop. You know, in the old days in, in the dark room, you would dodge and burn and you could do double exposures. And there were a lot of tools that you could use to enhance or change or manipulate photographs, um, even in that environment. But the suite of tools that are available, whether you're working in Lightroom or Photoshop or, you know, any of the um, photo software processing, you know, uh, types of software that are out there now. Um, it's just, you know, it's like, gosh, what a palette, you know, I'm just so grateful for the tools. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, fun to create in that space. But I tell you, doing underwater work, that's where I'm really grateful for digital, <laughs> because yeah. at the end of a roll of 36, when you're in a dry suit <laughs> with an under a huge you know with your underwater camera to haul yourself out dry off all of your equipment take you know the film out of the back of the camera which i used to do when i first started doing underwater work um i was still shooting film and you know whatever action was happening in the stream you just hope by the time you go through that you know 30 minute process to put a new roll of film in and get back in the water and look and see what's still going on. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't miss that at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm just so glad I have a, you know, a, a 32 gig card in my camera and, right. and I don't really have to think about it and can stay under there as long as I, I, you know, can stand it and don't freeze to death. <laughs> right. And, and so I should mention that um, in, in your, catalog of works you didn't include any of any of your underwater fish pictures and yeah. I'm just kind of curious was that was this your way of kind of escaping and 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 uh finding the love of you know photographs that weren't kind of tied to your work or um, I mean just just asking um why you chose no, it, to put those in yeah it was intentional for this show. Um, you know, Leslie and I talked a bit about, you know, what what kind of work we would include and, you know, sort of what maybe possible themes would be. 
And the more I looked at my work, I, I love black and white. It was my first love. And um, it isn't always what sells in the gallery. Um, some galleries, I mean, it just depends. And, and cer certainly also works that don't necessarily reflect the county often don't sell in the local gallery here. Um, people love the scenery here and are attracted to that for all the wonderful reasons, you know, but, um, you know, it just, I wanted to, I just really wanted to go back to black and white. And while I, I certainly, I love underwater and I love reflection and shooting fish and, and doing all of that, I kind of wanted to just, you know, go back to my early roots and also to highlight images that I really fell in love with. Um, may not be a market for them here. Um, you know, opportunities for online sales are always there, but um, it, it just really, I, I just kind of wanted to go back to my roots um, and uh, really look at my work from the perspective of black and white. Okay. I, you know, I'm fascinated because I love um, black and white photography and I, I too have dabbled a little in photography um, in the dark room as well as um, the new digital world. And uh, it's not as easy as it looks. And I think often um, photographers are, they really have to show their muscle because a lot of people think they can take professional photographs at the professional yeah. level. And honestly, that, that is not, that is, um, unfortunately it's not that there's so many people out there that don't realize they don't have the tools to make that happen. And really what it takes is knowledge the same basic knowledge that you needed before digital which is knowing aperture and shutter speed and all of those things uh, yeah you just take a picture with your cell phone but then there's this other side which is the now we call it light room where you're uh, basically working with images to edit them to still capture reality and manipulate a little bit to, uh, you know, show what you saw in front of you when you took that photograph. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm just always fascinated that, you know, we oftentimes we've had photo classes here, and oftentimes I think that people just think they know photography, that they know how to do and then you might get a few people that are like, well, you know, really, I just need to know how to organize my photos or, um, but it's really a lot more complicated than, it, than people think. So I, I don't know yeah. if you want to comment on that, but I do think that you deserve a lot more credit than I'm sure a lot of people um, haven't thrown your way, but you deserve a lot of credit because obviously you work very hard to make these images like, you know, stick and they're wonderful and uh, you really do. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's high praise. Um, <laughs> but, and, you know, for me, this is also, um, there's a, a little photograph that, that really doesn't look like much in this show. The, if we can flip to that real fast and I'll just give you the quick backstory on this. Um, it's the Cashier Mill. It's a structure. Yeah, the, there you go. So this is a this was the very first photograph I took at the age of ten, um, oh, okay. and it was with an old Polaroid camera. And this this is how it all started for me. And I think I talked about it in the bio um, about how what our different motivations are to press the shutter. And for me, not only was it to capture the beauty of the landscapes that I loved uh, in, in the Southern Sierra, but it was also documentation. And this is down in Death Valley. It was probably 105 degrees. My dad is sitting in the camper 
while I am traipsing around this hillside trying to get the best vantage point to document this old structure. It's part of an old mill or uh, an old mine, uh, gold mine in Death Valley. And, and uh, I just was so fascinated by these structures and always <laughs> so worried that they wouldn't be there the next time I came. So they gave me a real sense of time and the past. Um, and, and so documentation really, you know, hitched a ride in a lot of my motivation very early, early on. And that's why I included this, not that it's such a great photograph, but that this is kind of where it all started. The magic of pressing a button and having this little white piece of paper, you know, slip into my hand and 30 seconds later to have this image just all of a sudden appear was just magic. I mean, Disneyland had nothing on a Polaroid camera for me. I mean, it was, you know, it was just magic. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> you, you know, so the impression obviously lasted a long time, but, but this is sort of this, well, this is where it all began for me. And that's why I included it. And you know, made an early decision to to do primarily black and white, to not do fish, to not do water uh, in the traditional way that I kind of have been known to do. Well, I have to say this photograph, it's um, definitely the composition is pretty strong and um, it is black and white, but um, um, one thing I wanted to mention, because as you were talking and I was talking before about um, what photography is and, and how um, people, a lot of people now in the digital age, they can just take a picture with their phone or whatnot. But um, Mary, you do go the extra mile. You not only um, photograph and do all of the work in Lightroom, light meaning, um, the digital uh, editing, but you also print and you do all your matting and framing on your own. And that's not something that, I mean, I, I went to uh, a school where the artists thought was like required that they learn how to do all of that, uh, that work. And often I feel like a lot of artists and photographers do not know how to do that work. So um, that's also- Printing is, um, it never, you know, it, you get close to what you see on, on screen, but there's so much light that comes through a monitor. When you actually print something and then printing on different papers, um, it, you know, that's a whole world in, you know, unto itself. And, uh, um, you know, you can you can go to a lot of print houses and they do a pretty fine job now, but I'd be hard pressed to keep doing photography without pulling at least my own proofs. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I remember back when I took photography, you know, you always worked out what paper was your favorite. Did it have a matte print to it? Did it have a pearl? Did it have right. um, a dull? Provera's. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to weigh in the presentation of a photograph. So even though painters have a way that where they could be textural or, um, or uh, you know, uh, have some, some kind of rhythm within their uh, painting, uh, but photography has a little of that too with the papers that they choose. And, um, oh, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah they definitely impart different um, qualities to um, of color or black and white shadow gray. So um, I think what I'll do is uh, these are mics and so Debbie Carson I see you there hi thanks for joining us um, we're just about to wrap up. I'm so sorry. Um, it's six twelve, and I thought what I would do is stop sharing the screen. And well, can we go and see um, what the silent auction is at? Yeah, that's what I was gonna do. Oh, okay. So, um, 
think what I can do is see if I can figure this out. Okay. So it looks like Sarah Ann has won the hurricane. I don't know who that is, but um, I will email her and let her know that she's won the hurricane. Um, and then Wade S. Volt, uh, won the uh, spring below Mount Joseph. That's the Leslie Leviner painting. And Diane Daggett has won rock art by Mike Kulaski. So, awesome. Yeah. And that is, let's see, uh, 325. Uh, so that's one, that's um, 325. <laughs> So four twenty-five, four, almost four, five hundred dollars. Yeah, four eighty. Yeah, would go to the Willow County um, Business Fund. So that's awesome. And yeah. unfortunately, they're not here to celebrate that they've won. But I know uh, that's pretty darn cool. And uh, um, unfortunately, Diane, it looks like she bid on several things and but she did win the rock art, so that's great. So I, let me see if there were any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so I don't see that we have any questions. Do you have any questions, Debbie? now. <laughs> okay. I did record this, Debbie, so you can go back and watch. We kind of went through each artist's artwork, and we showed people how to use the website to view the artwork. Um, and uh, we chatted a lot about art and photography and, and all of that. So it was kind of fun. Leviner light. <laughs> yeah, Leviner light. Uh, that's a new catchphrase. It's going to be used in all the new art history books. That's and, right. Uh, I, it's if you want, Deb, you can come in on uh, the Josephi Center is opening on Monday, twelve to five are the hours. Masks are required, and uh, you can view the artwork face to face and uh, we encourage you to tell your friends. Otherwise, stay home and watch it or take a look at it on our website. So I'm gonna end with that. Mary, do you wanna add anything? No, it, it was a wonderful process and just so grateful to have an opportunity to be in a show with Mike and Leslie. Yeah. You know. I want to thank the Collins Foundation. They did help pay for this um, exhibit. And like I said, there will be a catalog available. I believe it's for $15 and it should be here in about two weeks. And it's not ready on the website to be pre-ordered, but um, will be available for pre-ordering. So thank you everybody for uh, coming and visiting with us and we hope you enjoy this video and enjoy the artwork. And if you can check out www.josephi.org and see what we have uh, exhibit wise. Otherwise there's so many other things to take a look at. So thank you, Mary. I really, really, really appreciate you being part of this. And I think you guys, Cheers. thank you. Say, yeah. I still have a little bit of time left. <laughs> it's really good. And my lips good, are good, good, good. Um, I know. <laughs> long, long Check story. your teeth. Okay. All right. Well, take care. And uh, thanks, All right. for, thanks for watching. Okay. Bye bye. Right. Take care, Cheryl. Bye.